Hello, this is Tim Stutler. Welcome to a Goodlessful Church production. Here in the fall of 2022, my wife and I had the joy of traveling to Israel. It was the first time that we were ever able to go. We traveled with Clayton King Ministries, with Clayton and Shari King, and 16 people from the Southeast United States. We had an incredible time. Our tour guide was Cyril Bar David of Yad Hashmana Guest House. He was extraordinary. And so what I did, I filmed each one of these stops filmed what he had to say, and we wanted to share those with you. We're calling this series, The Lay of the Land. I hope that you enjoy it. In today's episode of Lay of the Land, we are now on the Temple Mount with our guide, Cyril Bar-David. Again, with Clayton and Shari King of Clayton King Ministries. And I do apologize in advance. The wind was really blowing, and so our video picked up some wind noise. But the information is just absolutely amazing. i got to be honest. I've been a lot of places in this world, and theres I don't think there's any more favorite place for me than where we're going to be today in this video. It's the Temple Mount. To me, there's so much incredible history that takes place there from Abraham almost sacrificing Isaac, God promising that he would provide the lamb, Jesus teaching there in the temple courts, oh, Solomon building the temple and the glory of God inhabiting the temple, all these incredible things, plus the history of the destruction by the Babylonians, the destruction by the Romans is absolutely fascinating. And then after that, just what it's been for the past 2,000 years and how there's so much struggle over it between Muslims and Jews and Christians. And so I hope that you enjoy this episode of The Lay of the Land as we look at the Temple Mount. Blessings. So, before we continue walking, can you hear me? Okay. So, just have a look over here since we're, we're going to walk through the complex itself. But see all those capitals, those decorations that used to stand on top of pillars that were here from actually all different periods. It's not all of them from the exact same period, but it can be some of them from the actual temple that was standing here 2000 years ago and pillars that were surrounding the complex. Okay, so those heads, capitals, whatever you want to call it, they were up there. Some of it related to later on, you know, like Crusaders period and the Islamic period and even maybe some uh, from the Byzantine era, although during the Byzantine era, there was nothing up here, mm. okay? There was nothing up here during the Byzantine era. We'll speak a bit of that uh, in a moment. But try to see, and it's not very easy, but try to see how big complex it is. Now, we only see a small portion of it because you see the, the dome is standing up there. But the complex itself, the platform is going much farther behind it. It's a huge platform platform going from one side to the other side all the way there and farther north we were standing opposite to us it's you can't really see behind those trees up there which mountain is it Alice. right perfect you see you already know something yeah, <laughs> very uh, good first day you already know so we were standing there in the Mount of Olives, looking down towards us, which means to which direction we were looking. We're going west. No, we do things so we after one day. east and we look to the west. Right. And we said that where did the city started originally? Where was it compared to where we are standing right now? Down over the hill. Down there. south. Perfect. So down below us, this is where Jerusalem used to be, the Jebusite city that David took over. This is where it starts. Down there, it's a lower hill. If I would take my hand right now, and I would put it in that direction, okay, this is how it would look like. You would have the city of David like with a finger like that, the city of David in that direction, a long, narrow finger. And up above, you have the peak, which is up here, Mount Moriah, and then it goes a little lower, and then it climbs up, and it goes on to the north. So this is Mount Moriah. This is right, so this is now what we consider to be Mount Moriah. And we say that Abraham is coming from the Mount Moriah, it doesn't tell us Mount Moriah, but we do believe that later, since the Bible speaks about Mount Moriah, when it speaks of, to, to Solomon of building, you know, the temple and so on, it speaks on a specific mountain, it's not the land of Moriah anymore. So, I think that everyone, when I say everyone, it's Christians, uh, Jews and uh, Muslims, you know, they all believe in Abraham. For the Muslims, Abraham is the first uh, Muslim, in a sense, is what they believe. 
and they believe in many of the biblical characters that we read of, they, they see them in, as prophets. Okay? Of course, they don't accept the exact same story, the biblical story, but the characters, you know, Islam is built on both Judaism and Christianity. It's a combination of the two and something new that was formed out of it. So, for everyone up there, it's something that they, you know, connected to, 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 to the history. They, if we choose, believe that Abraham came here to Mount Raya, so they said, no, it didn't happen here. Where was it happening? In Saudi Arabia. Okay, so they, they changed the location of the event of Abraham and Isaac. It's not here. It's in a whole different place. We Jews believe that it was somewhere around here in Mount Moriah, okay, the land of Moriah. I don't know, the, the event is a different event, it's in a different spot. There is a tradition, and I'm using the word traditions because at the moment it's not biblical, I'm just using the word tradition, okay? Uh, both Jewish tradition, and also for a bit in the Islam, that from that mountain here, from the rock, but at least in the Jewish tradition it's a strong thing, this is where the world was created from, Okay, when God was forming the world in a sense, so the, the stone that today is inside the, the, the dome, under the dome of the rock, this is the foundation for everything, you know, when God founded the world in a sense, built the world, created the world. So again, it's, it's not biblical or anything like that, <coughs> Jewish traditions that were built on top of that. But, as we said, Abraham is coming here, there is nothing here, we don't know if it was happening here that he built an altar, or up there, or down below, we don't know the exact spot. Almost 800 years later, we have David, that you heard yesterday the story, okay, uh, that uh, actually purchased, purchased over here a piece of land. This Arona was offering, he was Jebusite, by the way, and he offered David to take it for free. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I will pay. So I would say, even from, in a sense, you can say legal, legal, a right, this place was purchased by a Jew, yeah. you know, 3,000 years ago. He bought this land. When we argue about history, you know, and rights and so on, who, who has the right to, to worship over here? The Muslims say, we only, Muslims were the only ones who were allowed to worship here. No one else, okay? Although there is 2,000 years of, uh, or 3,000 years of history for the Jewish nation that was here, and at least 1,500 years before they even started Islam, there was already Jewish worship up here. I said, no, no, Jews have no right to worship here. The, the problem is that I would say, and again, I'm talking from a political point of view, I don't really care, you know, because I don't need to worship here, but from a political point of view, when the state of Israel is going along with that and saying, fine, we, we accept that in a sense, only Muslims are allowed to worship here, and Jews and non-Jews are only allowed to come and visit and have a look for one hour and to get out of here, and you are not allowed to pray here, you are not allowed to worship here, you are not allowed to come here and read from the Bible or anything like that. I think, you know, it would never happen if it would be the opposite. If you would have an Arab Muslim army taking over a Christian or a Jewish state, they would never say, okay, okay, we let you keep your beliefs in a place that we Muslims used to be here before and worship before and had our mosque before. No, no, it's yours. We are not going to interfere. Of course, it would never happen. They will immediately go there and change the whole thing and say it's ours and whoever is not happy with that can be, you know, in the good case, you can live. In the worst scenario, we'll execute you or jail you. So there is, here is Israel for some reasons, and again, it's political reasons, national reasons. In 19, 1967, when Israel won the Six Days War and took over the entire complex, Israel said in order to keep it kind of peaceful around, okay, we, we don't change anything, yeah, we, we won the war, but here you still have your holy sites to, to worship in, and we are not going to interfere in that. But back to, now to Solomon. David is the one who purchased the land up here somewhere, some kind of a threshing floor, and it fits very well when you think about the, the, the threshing floor. What do you do in the threshing floor? Grind wheat. Okay, you, you basically you separate, separate, wheat, you separate wheat from chaff. Yeah. That is what you do. Okay, and you need to have it somewhere outside where there is wind. Oh, okay. okay, so it fits very well. Also, we are on top of the hill. 
Okay, we are somewhere where you can even feel right now it's a great weather, but it's a bit windy. You must have wind in order to do that, to separate when you throw the whole thing in the air after you were crushing it, okay, with the, this uh, threshing sledge, I would say. But David is purchasing, he's not allowed to build a temple, although he would like to build a temple, as it was mentioned yesterday. His sword was covered with blood and God said, I'm not going to let something like that. Imagine. David himself, the great king, the one who really worshipped God and loved God, it's not enough. You had your role, you had, I, I was using you for something, but there is a different person that should build the temple, okay? Not someone that his sword is covered with blood, it's not the purpose of his son. And his son Saul. And Saul is building a temple, which again, we have no idea where exactly it was standing up here, on top of Mount Moriah. We don't know. It was it a bit to the west, a bit to the east, farther north, over here. We don't know where was it, but remember that the landscape was not the same. We are here standing on the big platform, but if we would be here 3,000 years ago when Solomon and David are here, it's a steep hill that goes up all the way to the top peak of the hill that you see behind you. You can see the, the hill climbing up there, but you don't feel that it goes down a steep way, all the way down to the city of David. Okay, so they were climbing from Jerusalem, remember the city is down there, they are climbing up to Mount Moriah, to their north, into a temple that was built up there. And this temple is standing for several hundreds of years, okay, from the 10th century recently until the 6th century, and then it is being destroyed by the Babylonians. That's it, there is no temple, people are being exiled. 70 years later, they start to come back from Babylon, and soon later, they build here a temple. And you, basically, it's a, I would say that in most books, you will find it called the second temple, although some said it's the first, but in most places, you read about the second temple period officially, from archaeological point of view and historical point of view, this is the moment the second temple is standing. Okay, so you have now a new temple, poor temple. Yes. The poor temple. Read in the, the book of Ezra that the priests and all those who were old enough to see the new temple and to know how the old Solomon's temple used to look like, they were crying. Yeah, it was like, you know, imagine you, you saw this beautiful, amazing temple that was built by this great so called King Solomon, covered with gold from inside and everything like that. You know, very, very rich temple. And suddenly there is just a building there, standing a poor building where people are supposed to go and sacrifice. And they were weeping. But that's what they could do. That's it. It's Basically a, a simple temple. So this temple is standing for several hundreds of years. This is the temple during the time of Nehemiah. This is the temple that stands there. And later on, in the 4th century, the Greeks, Alexander the Great, in the 4th century BC, Alexander the Great is taking over the entire region, the Middle East. Okay? And since that moment and on, we speak about the Hellenistic period here. Later on, the Romans are coming, but the Hellenistic thinking, okay, the Greek philosophy and everything is starting to enter to this region too. And the temple is standing there. And it's still a poor temple, again, for centuries. It's a poor temple. We, I'm not going to enter into every story of the history, but if you heard of it, I don't know if you were aware of that or not, there was a family that was called the Hasmoneans when the Hellenistic regime, we used to say Greek, it's not exactly Greek, I would just say Greek in general, okay? We have uh, the Greek Empire divided, okay, to the region of Damascus, to the region of Egypt, to the region of Europe and so on, doesn't really matter. In general, it was all Greek influence over this region with local people. And this temple was defined by the Greek, I would say, the king, Antiochus, okay, the fourth. And it causes a revolt. He, he, he did many bad things. He, he told the Jews, you're not allowed to circumcise your babies anymore, you're not allowed to read from the Torah anymore, you're not allowed to go to your synagogue, all different things. And a revolt started led by a family called the Hasmoneans, also known as Maccabi. Okay?
most of those brothers died one after the other. They were brothers, a family that were rebelling, leading their fault. They died one after the other. They were killed in that revolt. And eventually, the Greeks were out of here. And 100 years of a local Jewish dynasty okay, that are ruling over the people. These are, these are the Hasmoneans. family and so on. So Herod is gaining also power under his father. Eventually even in, even in get the position of a, a ruler of, of Galilee, not as a king, just as a governor in his house. And eventually we're not going to enter into Herod. He's fighting against that dynasty that he takes over with the soldiers. Okay? Herod himself appears to be the king. In his late years, not at the beginning, but later on in his late years, he says, listen, you choose had problems because the nation didn't like him. Again, he's not from the original Jewish priesthood dynasty or anything like that. He considered to be a foreigner. Although officially he's Jewish, they didn't consider him as one. Why? Because his family originally were uh, Edomites, Edomians, okay? Gentiles, pagans. So yes, his father or even maybe his grandfather was converted to Judaism, but still you are not really so called pure ancient Jewish dynasty, nothing like that. So he all the time tried to prove the Jews, you know, from one hand that I'm strong, don't mess with me. At the same time here, look, I'm going to build now something for you Jews, for us Jews, he's part of the Also, people <laughs> builders. Why is that? Any reason to do such a thing? No. Sorry? They knew the structure? Not because of that. Whole because place. the holy and the holy of holies, you can't let builders build it. Right. It's only priests that are allowed to be that in that complex. Okay? So he was using priests to build it, train them as builders, and also according to what it says that they were using in order to build the inner part of the Holy of Holies so you don't want to be exposed so called to that space they were using boxes so they would lower them down inside boxes that you are facing the wall you can deal with the wall but you are not exposed to the, to the space behind you okay so was it eight years nine years what does the New Testament say about the project because John is writing about that and he mentioned that over there, they were speaking to Jesus when he said, you know, so you say you can destroy and build the, the temple in three days. He said, the, the people told Jesus, it, it took 46 years to build this project. You said that you can destroy and build it, rebuild it in three days. And most archaeologists think that the New Testament is the right version. I mean, that the New Testament, the, the, the number of 46 years, something like that, that you can build this project, it's the accurate number, not eight years such a huge platform and again we're talking 2000 years ago when you have a low hill going down you know what how do you how do you raise such a platform you need to build arches so there are arches down below us all over arches and there are huge supporting walls to those arches so those arches won't collapse okay so when you were looking at the western wall when you were looking yesterday at the eastern wall and when we were looking yesterday at the southern wall all those walls are just walls that support those arches. The 
that they want to collapse. And then on top of those arches you build the platforms that we're standing on. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, it's a huge thing actually to, to move all those things, even these days with tractors and protect them in trunks. So back then we had animals and girls and people to, to move stones. The smallest stone that they found in the supporting all the way from back to the Okay, let's go. The biggest stone that was found is actually at the western side of the supporting wall, it's there down below. Uh, there is a tunnel that goes underneath, and it's possible to see that if you visit what is called the water tunnel. And it's 45 feet long. Okay? It used to be 50 feet high and around 10 feet wide. Over 400 tons. Okay? How do you do such a thing? They are moving that thing somehow because it is placed on other stones. Okay? So imagine what does it mean how many hundreds of pools you need to pull such a thing and you need those big logs to put it on top of those uh, that put this stone on top of them so you can roll it over and ropes from all over to stop it when it goes downhill or uphill. It's crazy. So but still they were doing that. So it doesn't really matter if it's 45 years or 40. Probably the project went on after Herod died. They were keep going on with that project, his son, and so But the platform, what we see today, most of what we see today is actually from Herod's time. Okay, the, the, the surface itself that you see. I'll jump because, again, the history over here, we can always speak about 4,000 years of history, and we don't want to do that. We skip, sorry. May I ask one question? When you talk about arches, are they like that, that kind of an arch? Yes, yes. Okay, they okay. Don't like that, but, yes. but an arch that they yes. build on top. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Like you, when you see an aqueduct, for okay, example, thank you. okay, there are some Roman arches. Thank you. Uh, the difference between the arches below us and these arches is their shape. These are the uh, sharp uh, arches, okay? So those are more... They are sharpened than the round uh -huh. arches. And these sh uh, arches, we'll get to them in a moment. Uh, Rome is here. The Romans destroy Herod's temple, okay, the year 70, since then we don't have any temple anymore. For the past 2,000 years, no temple. And when the Romans are here, they built here some kind of a pagan temple. Later on, the Byzantines, okay, when it turned to be like a Christian empire, they take away the, the pagan temple, but they keep it empty. So this entire hill turned to be like the place for trash for the city itself of Jerusalem. Okay? And only when the Muslims are entering here at the 7th century, at 638, then they start to relate to this mountain the, the tradition or the event of Muhammad. Okay? When we speak about Islam, it, it was established as a religion in the 7th century. And when they invade here to this region, they say, what was happening here, actually? They said, Muhammad, he had his night journey, riding his flying horse, this is what it says in the Quran, and he was riding all the way, where to, what does the Quran say? Where was he riding to? To the edge of the world, basically, to the edge. This is what it says, the edge. And over there, he went off his horse, basically, and he was ascended to heaven, received all the information that he needs in a sense, came down and right back to Saudi Arabia. So they say, okay, the place that it happened, the, that place, the edge where he flew to or with his horse was over here on top of this hill. And this is where he was sent up to heaven. That's why you see the golden dome that was built at the 7th century. And actually it's one of the oldest buildings in the world. The building as a building stands there since the 7th century. The dome itself was damaged in an earthquake during the 10th, 11th century, but it was rebuilt. But as a building, as a structure, from the 7th century, the end of the 7th century, it stands there as it is. So they built it as a shrine to commemorate the spot where Muhammad was ascended to heaven. And over here, they built a mosque. This is the El Aqsa Mosque. You hear in the news about the El Aqsa Mosque. In Arabic, El Aqsa is the edge, the edge mosque. This is where you pray, this is to commemorate the event. So of course when you have your 200 or 300,000 Muslims that are coming to pray, they pray all over, okay? Also around the shrine, but 
mosque and they enter inside the mosque is where they start from, inside the mosque, and then they go outside and meet a lot of people, and you can see here hundreds of thousands of people that are praying, all of them facing where? South Arabia to Mecca. So they're actually praying with their back to the shrine, to the Dome of the Rock, okay? So this is the, where with the Islam the 7th century, of course the crusaders are coming later on, they turn that into a, into a palace, and they turned that into a church, okay, the, the domes turned to be a church. Later on the Muslims come back, they turn it back to a shrine and back to a mosque. And since then it stays under the Muslim control basically until the British are coming here in the 20th century. And then the Jordanians are here and then in 1967 in the, in the Six Days War, Israel finally is taking over what we call the east side of Jerusalem together higher than we were standing down there so up here and you can see uh, we can even walk in a moment to this little kind of gray dome over there it's the original bedrock i mean of the mountain itself so we are now at the surface you can say that of where the mountain used to be 3000 years ago so there would be no floor here mm. and no building here so we will be up on top of that heap okay that would go all the way down and we go a little bit farther down below us, um, but it's all covered with stones since the time of Herod. He's just the one who covered the whole thing with stones and arches, and there are some cisterns also down below to collect water. If you remember, or maybe you don't, it doesn't really matter, we're going to be tomorrow in the, the model of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus, uh, so you can see there, um, it will be a nice model that shows us also how the temple used to look like. But the temple itself, if let's, let's imagine right now that there is a temple standing here. And once again, we don't know, we don't know if it was exactly where the dome is. Was it a little bit to the north? Was it a little bit more to the, uh, to the south, west? We, we are not sure exactly where was it standing on top of the platform. Um, but it was somewhere up here. And the building itself, the temple itself was higher than the dome that you see today. Really? Yes. It was higher than that and it was facing east. Okay? It was facing east. So the doors, like the door over here, imagine that this is the door for a temple. So you would have a court, okay? This You have a building in front of you and when you leave the building, like if you come out of the building, of course people couldn't enter. It's only the priest that you enter there. But if they come out or let's start from the opposite direction. If you are a pilgrim that is coming to visit the temple, most pilgrims would come from down south. Remember the tunnels that I spoke of? In the, in the, in the southern wall, remember the southern gates that we spoke of? Those big wide tunnels were leading thousands of pilgrims all the way up to the surface where you were sitting, where you were sitting and you were speaking. Imagine you will see an opening in that platform and you will see many people climbing up like you have in the subway, people coming yeah. out of the subway, exactly the same thing, just wide tunnels. They would come from up there, from down below, up to the surface. They would walk to the eastern side where all those trees are. And from there, they would come and climb. We don't know if it's this staircase that was standing here or there was a different staircase, but they would climb up from the east, climbing up towards this direction. And they would enter into an open courtyard that only Jews were allowed to get there. Okay, around, if, you, if, if this is the temple, and there is a walls around with that courtyard. Around this entire complex, there was a fence, a low fence, something like one meter high, three feet high, something like that, surrounding it. The whole thing is inside the huge complex that we're looking at, but only Jews were allowed to cross that fence. Gentiles were not allowed to, to cross it. There were signs, okay, in different languages. They found a, a full, completed sign in Greek. Mm. It's in Turkey, in the museum, that says that Gentiles basically are not allowed to cross it and anyone who do that is risking his life. Mm. Okay? They, they might be executed basically. Gentiles are not allowed to enter. If you remember with Paul, uh, when Paul was blamed by the Jews here at the Temple Mount that uh, he was bringing a Gentile into the temple and they wanted to kill him. Remember that in the book yes. of Acts it happened. So. It was a dangerous thing to do. So Gentiles could come to the platform where you were sitting before. They could walk around that platform. There was a beautiful uh, building standing at the far south side of the of the complex, you know, with many, many columns. 
the entire complex that we see around us, when I say entire, it's not up here, that platform, the, the entire platform below us too, was surrounded by around 150 columns, wide columns, according to Josephus, those columns that were supporting the southern building, they were so wide that you had to have three men holding hands around one of them. Okay, mm. they were su supporting a, mm. it was a huge basilica, like a Roman basilica, a big rooftop. I don't know if any of you have been to Greece there, to Athens, and you saw there is a standing basilica there in the ancient part of Athens. Exactly the same thing. Herod saw what the Romans are doing, and he said always, I will try to do it better. Mm. Uh, he, he had a problem, I guess, you know, some character problem. He <laughs> always had to prove that he can do everything better than anyone else. And to prove that he's the greatest, he couldn't be the greatest because he couldn't be the emperor of Rome, never. So he tried to do his best over here as the king of Judah and to prove himself to the Romans again and again and again. So you would have up here some kind of a courtyard that only Jews are allowed to enter. And so both men and women were allowed to enter when we're speaking of the second temple. In the first temple, probably only men were allowed. Second temple, it's both men and women are allowed to be in this open courtyard. And then there was a staircase that was leading you up higher, that over there only men were allowed to climb up higher, closer to where the altar was standing. The altar was standing outside the temple. And then the Levites, the priests, and so on, they would be the ones that sacrifice on an altar. And behind the altar, you would have the building itself, okay? The, the priests can enter inside the building into the holy. You would open the door, you would enter inside, you would have the holy. And then there will be, in, and inside the holy, what would you find? The holy of holies. The Sorry? holy of holies. No, no, but oh, uh, what, what uh, there is a showbread, the showbread, uh, brazen, uh, the brazen labor is on the outside. Yes, little altar and the menorah, yeah. right? Menorah, uh, candles. Okay, so this is what you find in the holy, and then you have the veil that go all the way up. And what do you have behind it? Holy, oh, this ark. What do you have behind it? Holy, holy. Originally. Originally, exactly. Yeah. What would you find during the time of Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. It's empty. There. Yeah. The presence it's of God. God. Yeah. So it's the ark is not there anymore. Okay. In the first temple, they have also the manna and Aaron's staff and the ark. Okay. But uh, in the second one, it's empty. Basically, there is nothing. So this is what would happen here. This is how it would look. Tomorrow, you will see a nice model of Jerusalem. You could also see the model, the part of the temple in it. Uh, so you can understand much better. Now, can I say one thing? Yeah. Yes, of course. Sorry. Of course. Steps Does anyone go into the Let's walk down in a moment. I just wanted to say one quick thing that um, when we came with uh, Dr. Pinoy, mm -hmm. Clayton's professor, um, years ago, he was talking about if you guys imagine the journey that they took, right? He would, um, Suriel was talking about how hard it is to come as a pilgrim, right? And to bring a sacrifice. Some of them w would say, possibly might bring a sacrifice is what we were taught, but a lot of them would end up buying them here if they could afford it. But say they cleanse themselves down. In the Pool of Siloam. In the Pool of Siloam. But then they had to journey up here. So this was taught to me, and I don't know, you can correct me if you're wrong, but the desire to be pure when you get up here and passing through the Gentile marketplace and all that area, could have been stressful for those who journeyed here and so one of the reasons possibly why Jesus was so angry at the marketplace itself was that as people with a good heart who wanted to come here and worship the Lord with their sacrifices and come and be accepted um, would have to pass through the Gentile area with that fear of coming all this way and possibly being rejected to be able to give their sacrifice and go and so that was maybe the heart of Jesus and that people had a heart to worship but if that if their desire was corrupted by the fact that they were turned away that could cause them to be very disheartened of course because you can imagine the journey that they've taken to get here mm -hmm. and so we were just uh, we were taught that it would it could have been a very wonderful time to worship but then also with the marketplace being like a Gentile area and then say corrupt uh, the corruption possibly of the Pharisees to turn away a sacrifice and say it's not good enough and then have to resell them 
something that was quote better uh, was something that would could be disheartening for a pilgrim, someone who took a pilgrimage here. So I don't know if that's that good. sounds at all accurate to stuff that you know, but that's what we were taught um, by Dr. Kanoy, yeah. professor. And, and you know, it's just stressful. You've taken this long journey to want to worship, and though so there for Jesus. His heart is to see the people be able to worship God and not necessarily have to have all everything completely perfect in order to come to God. Which is which is a beautiful thing because you think that Jesus himself then corrects that in our worship because he becomes the perfect sacrifice and we don't have to worry about <laughs> all of these things being perfect when we come to him. And so isn't that wonderful to think about? So anyway. Yeah, let me read that. I'm gonna read let me it's just two verses. Matthew twenty one 12 and 13 happened right here. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So Jesus is in many ways as Messiah, he is bringing judgment against the corruption of the temple system, like Shari said, because they had figured out a way to tell the pilgrims who were coming, your sacrifices aren't good enough. We don't accept those. But look, we have some right here. We'll sell you and we'll make the profit off of it. And this angered Jesus tremendously. I think those guys are still working down the street there, yeah, aren't they? They're still, yeah, they're still in the, they're still yeah. in the market. And I, I want to make sure that I draw attention to you right here. All right, so let me let me just ask y'all if if any Bible story from the Gospels comes to mind when I do this. Yeah, right. In the yes. Mm -hmm. Well, what what story is that? The woman they brought the woman to adultery. John chapter eight. They catch a woman in adultery. They drag her. Now think about what they had to do. They dragged her up to the temple courts. Jesus is in the temple courts. The law of Moses demands that we stone this woman because she was caught in the very act of adultery. What do you say? And Jesus stoops down and writes on the ground. Nobody knows what he wrote. Nobody has any idea what he wrote. But I want to read to you Deuteronomy 9.10. And the Lord delivered unto me, this is Moses speaking, two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spoke with you on the mount of Sinai. So don't miss this. Again, symbolism, layer upon layer upon layer. When Jesus stoops down and puts his finger on the stone, my opinion, he is saying to them, I'm God. You don't bring the law to me and try to use the law to stone a sinner. I'm God. I wrote the law. And now I am rewriting the law of grace because he put his finger on stone, the stone floor in the temple. Just look around. The whole thing is stone. Jesus puts his finger on the stone and every single Jew would have known Deuteronomy 9.10. And this is one of the reasons why they were so angry at Jesus because he claimed to be God. It's one of the times he did that. down if needed. So they control the entire thing from up above. This is what was happening here. When we read about Paul, remember when we read about Paul and the story that he was blamed, that he was brought to Gentile and the Jews started to beat him here at the temple, they wanted to kill him. It says that the Roman officer, they saw that something is happening. So they send the soldiers, the soldier grabbed Paul and they took him to the fortress. Okay, the fortress is here. It was located over here in the corner. They took him over there and then the whole conversation, you know, with Paul that the, at the beginning, the, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, they beat him. And he says, how are you allowed to do that to a Roman citizen? And whoa, they were afraid. He suddenly, because he is a Roman citizen, you are not supposed to do such a thing. Of course, it was a very, very, a, I would say, a great status to be a Roman citizen. So the moment he said that, everything changed towards him from that officer and the soldiers. But later on, he was speaking to the Jews that were here. He started to speak to them, you know, in Hebrew. And he asked the officer, said, can I talk to them in Hebrew? And he was preaching to them, okay? Like, starting to speak to them about what? About Jesus. Now, 
you can you can later on if you have time to, to have a look at it in what point of Paul's so-called preaching or speech to the Jews they freaked out what was the thing the trigger that turned them that they all suddenly wanted to kill him while he was talking because at the beginning they all listened oh when Paul was talking yeah uh, when he when he accused them of murdering the Messiah not yet they're, then they are not angry yet the moment that he said no, yeah. that the moment that he said that they now will. it is for the Gentiles, that he is now oh, sent yeah, to the yeah, Gentiles. Yeah, yeah. The okay. moment he said that, uh, he already spoke of Jesus, they said nothing. I mean, they were all listening <laughs> what, what he had to say. The moment he said, but now it is given in a sense, I'm sent to the Gentiles, it's sent to the Gentiles, this is it. Opening up the kingdom. They yeah. got crazy. And then they tried to kill him immediately. And the Roman soldiers, they took him, grabbed him back into the fortress to protect him. Okay, and then he heard by some of his relatives mm -hmm. that they are planning. They decided not to eat, to fast, basically, until they will. They took an oath over themselves, like a forty men or something like that. They they won't eat until they will kill Paul. And he told that to the Roman officer. And then at midnight, they took out Paul from Jerusalem all the way to Caesarea that we're going to visit on Sunday. Protected by Roman soldiers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all the way there to to Caesarea. We're going to leave the complex. Hey, this is, isn't this the area where the Romans really started to breach and come in and they, they had a big battle here? Yes, from the northern side. And then once they got through the fortress, that's when they, yeah. they burnt the temple. Yeah, they later yeah. on entered inside. Yeah. There you go. I hope you've enjoyed being on the Temple Mount, at least in your imagination. I hope that you understand the significance of all that God has done for us there. But here is the great thing. God's going to return. And how awesome will it be when he sets up his kingdom and we are present with him in body once again. Oh, that's going to be a great day. God bless you. I hope to see you there.